Awesome. Tom, so good to have you here. Really excited to uh, share a little bit more of your experience with our listeners. Um, maybe you could just start with uh, giving us a little bit of an introduction onto your journey and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So yeah, um, for, first and foremost, I, I, I think I shout out to the partnership leader group. I, I got to tell you, I think the work that that, that you're doing uh, is phenomenal for the industry, but also for uh, for people that are in my role. I, I, I've been doing this job for a long time. Um, and I think the community of practice that you're building is just fantastic. It's you know, it, it, it's like being a Portland Trails by play, Portland Trailblazer fan in, in Zurich. You, you find somebody wearing the jersey and they look, look, there's more people like me. And so uh, just full, full credit. Right. It's just been fantastic. The community of practice and the fact that, you know, it started on uh, you know Slack and has now developed out into full channel is just fantastic. So anyway, uh, long story short. So my uh, so Tom Williams, VP of Alliances. Um, here at uh, Sugar CRM, um, my um, current role is to run the global partner program uh, for uh, primarily on dis distribution. We we, we kind of separate the the um, uh, the division of labor between technology partnerships. So ISVs, people that are taking their technologies and 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 uh, is a spoke to Sugar as a hub. Uh, so there's that piece that's run by uh, another gentleman on, on my team, uh, Matt Marin, who uh, it, we I work with closely. I focus primarily on the channel side, which is um, uh, resellers, distributors, um, affiliate relationships. Uh, uh, I own the program globally and then revenue responsibility here in America, but, uh, or sorry, in, in the America. So, uh, North America and Latin. So a, a little bit about background, I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I'll try not to bore people with it, but I think there's the relevancy, the why I'm on this call is I've essentially been doing this job since I've been out of college by complete happenstance and random events. I started off as an English lit major and did a, a tour of duty with an HP contractor. And I'm like, man, this technology thing is cool. I'd like to go work there. And so I got into the job as a technical, um, a technical writer, started within the, the R&D group, running tech pubs and specifications and then got co-opted into um, RFP writing, um, which ultimately was my first foray into th uh, managing third-party um, relationships. So um, I was uh, fortunate enough to work for a, a bit of a spinoff of Motorola, um, and they had all the discipline around um, third-party partner management, whether that is third-party products, hardware, professional services, but be able to coalesce all of those pieces into a single unified proposal to put in front of a customer. And those are fairly large, multi-million dollar uh, opportunities. And that was kind of my crucible of trial by fire of getting in and figuring out not only how you would sell with a with a partner, but also what that looked like long term for the for the relationship once that was sold. How does it get implemented? How does it get you know uh, delivered, supported, billed, invoiced? All of those things. It was kind of the first part of it. You know, so I went through a bit of a progression where I started off as a as you know sort of in in uh, as a business manager uh, for a company called uh, Mobile Data Solutions, focusing on utilities, and then parlayed that into a couple of other gigs. Probably most notably was uh, Pivotal CRM, uh, where I spent five years um, as uh, a, the director of strategic appliances there. I focused a little bit on the technology and on the program, and then really focused. You know, in the latter portion of that is focusing on large account management, so platform relationships. So Microsoft, um, you know, this house was basically built by uh, managing the Microsoft relationship for multiple ISVs. And so that was, you know, understanding how to navigate uh, platform relationships was very different than managing a single ISV. So, you know, it's much more of a, you know, land and expand kind of strategy, go viral within those programs, but also introduced me to a lot of programs. I mean, I think from my standpoint, my experience has been Microsoft really was the gold standard when I was starting, right? They had the most robust program, at least from a, you know, a software perspective. Again, you know, that's, that's been my focus is exclusively within software, but Microsoft really was the gold standard. And you see a lot of the DNA that came out of Microsoft, go to Amazon, go to Salesforce, go to other Oracle, you go to other, um, other large um, enterprise players. And a lot of that DNA has really um, come across. And so that was a really good, helpful sort of proving ground for me to just understand how to understand those programs and then understand what I needed to do to get around those programs. Right. And so that was a learning. 
I, I, I moved from Pivotal to, um, to the U.S. I was in, based in Canada and then um, moved to, to the U.S. to work for a company called WebTrans. That didn't work out as a long-term play, but it did get me introduced to Exact Target, which was a big Salesforce partner at the time. Worked at Exact Target for about four years before getting acquired by Salesforce and then spent four years at Salesforce. So, so since then, basically been doing the same playbook, which is building out a program, building out um, uh, and recruiting partners, primarily focused on, on distribution. Um, so resellers, um, distributors, but um, really at Salesforce, it was more focused on consultancies and agencies uh, and, you know, people that are providing services in and around that application. Uh, so that got me introduced to things like business process outsourcers and, and uh, managed services providers. So a pretty wide uh, uh, span of, uh, of experiences, but doing it at scale. I mean, my, you know, I had an enormous quota there and somehow always made it. Um, it was quite quite literally monopoly money, um, you know, when you when you looked at it at the beginning of the year. So I got a good sense of, you know, the startup realm, the mid mark, you know, sort of the ABC series funded companies and then, you know, late stage uh, growth companies at exact target and then post acquisition at the enterprise level fortune, you know, 100 kind of experience. So kind of have that whole land, uh, uh, that landscape. And then now working at sugar, the important thing for me coming in was I can't do what I did four years ago here, not in this market, not with this product, not with this company, not with this partner set. What was really important for me or what I, the key learning for me is that while I have all these sort of things that I've learned along the way, what I really need to do is I need to make sure that I'm rethinking what I've done in the past, what works in the past, to make sure that it works for, for this product, for this market space, for this competitive set um, at this time. Because, you know, if COVID has taught, taught us anything, it's that everything changed, right? So anyway, hopefully I wasn't too long-winded on that. No, it's amazing. And I think... Uh... So much great stuff to dive into there, to be honest. And I think, uh, yeah, I'll do my best to be able to dive into it all during the time that we have, uh, but it might be tricky. Um, so tell me a little bit about what it has been like partnering with Microsoft early in your career. Like, I think you, you, you mentioned that Microsoft was the gold standard. I think for many, Microsoft is still a gold standard. You know, the the 95% of business going through the partner ecosystem is banded around a lot as a, a benchmark for what great looks like. You know, 40% of business coming from partners was like a really nice, healthy metric for me. And, you know, seeing 95% of business with partners is something that I think is an amazing aspirational goal. So like, what was it about Microsoft and the way that they partnered that made them such a gold standard at that time and what what's your hypothesis on how they've been able to kind of maintain that quality i mean like you could talk about they had the most most robust system they had them they spent millions of dollars on their partner portal they had staff and you know they had all the commitments to resource but you know me personally just one person's opinion doug bergham doug bergham the ceo of great plains when they acquired great plains this is before Dynamics, right? So they, they go out and they buy five ERP companies and, and they develop a CRM, you know, and so you've got, you know, you've got, uh, you know, Great Plains, Navision, SAFTA, <coughs> Solomon, Solom, uh, Solomon, you know, you have five competing ERP solutions and you add CRM into that. Doug Burgum and, the, and what he did with, you know, the, the, the partner sessions, in South Dakota, it was absolutely epic. I mean, his commitment to the ethos, right? The ethos of partnership, right? First and foremost, it came from the top. Absolutely, the top of the food chain was saying, we're committed to partners and everybody listened, right? And, and you know, look, I can do what I do and you can do what you do, but at the end of the day, if it's not coming from the top, you don't have that air cover. So there's going to be a limit in terms of what you can accomplish individually. But when you have that vision, when you have somebody that's such a vocal proponent at the top, it takes down so many barriers because there's no, like, it's not like, well, you guys aren't really committed to partnership. You know, we want to do this thing, but you guys aren't really committed to partnership. That It takes that completely off the table. So all things are possible. Not to say that you should do all things, but I think that was it. And his, you know, when he, he would get people so worked up when, you know, he would get in front of people and he, had, he was a great speaker, a great motivational speaker. 
he would get out there and he would talk about, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a historical figure and how that historical figure played out. And so he would create this narrative about a vision that he was trying to and it was complete vapor. Right. It's like all of us. Right. We're all kind of selling this selling the sizzle, but he's selling a vision and people bought in and it made it made the job fun. It created a community. It created um, it created an environment where, look. We're always going to face challenges. We're always going to have big problems. You're going to break things. It's like we're doing things for the first time. Things are going to break, right? It's never going to be, you know, when was the last time you did something awesome the first time, right? It just, it's never awesome the first time. So it's always an iterative process, but he made it, he made the vision possible. And you really see that if you look at the progression of that partner program since then, it really did form the DNA of what Microsoft, you know, was and is in terms of their commitment to partnership. They took that same ethos and applied it to all the other products, not just Dynamics. And I think it, I think it had a big impact. I mean, that's just me on the outside. I haven't worked for Microsoft. I've worked with Microsoft, so I was never in the walls. I've, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in, in Redmond and on, on a, you know, uh, in, in lots of those, you know, been badged in those, in those buildings, but you know, that, that was my sense of it. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think that, that, if I look at other ecosystems, if I look at, you know, I, uh, you know, the Salesforce ecosystem, if I look at AWS, um, you know, I, I don't really see the same, right? I don't see those that that same. They're different. They have their values and their benefits to it. But I do think with with Microsoft, they, I, that that is a that was that's what makes them unique, at least in my mind. Mm, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think. Uh... We've all got so much to learn still from what they've been able to build and how they do things today. Um, I would love to hear about Exact Target and, you know, like that journey of partnering with Salesforce to getting acquired by Salesforce, you know, to becoming a Salesforce employee, you know, and, and, and working on, again, like one of the most exciting partner programs on the planet, probably. Um, so t t tell us a little bit about Exact Target, what the partners were like there and like what your relationship with Salesforce looked like at that time. Yeah, sure. So it started when I was at Web Trends. We were, you know, we were a, um, a, a reasonable size uh, partner for, for Salesforce. Um, and then a lot of the people that I worked with at WebTrends ended up going and taking leadership positions at Exact Target. There was sort of a, we were doing a multi, we were doing kind of a joint go to market between Microsoft CRM, uh, Exact Target, and WebTrends. So this sort of closed loop marketing playbook that we had. And we sold that to a couple of, uh, uh, of people. And that really introduced us, uh, you know, as organizations and to people. And then, you know, Exact Target really started to be a rocket ship, right? And and so what was what was cool about that experience, and we knew it at the time, is that was kind of rarefied air. That was mm -hmm. definitely a rocket ship. And there was, I was, I think I came in, I was around, you know, the 130th employee or something like that. And we ended up selling and we, we were six or 7,000 when we sold. Um, but that experience, you know, not dissimilar to Microsoft. The, the experience there is that we had a CEO um, that, that uh, you know, was just inspired vision and said, we are going to have, uh, uh, you know, um, we're going to have a, we're going to be, we're going to, define a category. We're going to own the category and we're going to market. We're going to be the segment leader within that category. And that was the vision. It wasn't that we're going to make the world a better place. It's not that we're going to solve, you know, the cure to cancer, but that vision in itself was in, inherent in everything that we did. And that created a lot. And that was really what people wanted to be part of that. And that really changed the dynamic with, with, with Salesforce, right? So we, Salesforce didn't have an email integration tool at the time. We complemented their CRM, their sales strategy quite well. And, and it looked, but also we were a selling machine. And so we we were executing on that. And that was really the lifeblood. Um, at one point, I think we were the top selling download on App Exchange, you know, 100 years ago. Um, you know, that was kind of a fleeting thing. But at the time we were pretty and that made it clear that, you know, that was a that was a growth area for Salesforce, which probably mm -hmm. opened the door to the acquisition. The partnership there was it was, we went viral, right? We worked with the sales teams, we worked with the marketing teams, we worked with the product teams, we worked with the partner teams. And I think that that's how, with any of these large enterprise deals, that's how you do it is you've got to get viral. And, you know, it's great to have one person, a champion within that organization and work with them on one-on-one, -on -one, but you can't be single threaded. You really do need to proliferate and have more of a, 
you know, have a more of a unified multi-touch point to really to get things done and do it in a, in, in sort of a, um, um, uh, a, a, you know, consortium kind of manner, right? Where you're, you're, you've got friends in multiple places. That was the Microsoft, you know, thing is like, okay, they put programs up all day long and I spend all day trying to get around their programs. I just go try and find somebody smart and like, Hey, can you help me with this thing? Right. So, um, that's, that's the game we play. Yeah. And, and so when you were working, cause obviously like, like, you know, being a super early employee, at a company like exact target, you know, if you're around a hundred employees, like I imagine most of the time, like I've worked at uh, like early companies like that. Like I was, it was around a hundred employees when I joined Optimizely and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, we were like, and we worked a little bit with web trends by the way. Um, but, uh, the, you know, for us, it was like, uh, we just want new business and we want it however we can get it, you know, and, and, and it was hard to like really double down on a specific partner, you know? Um, but, uh, like, and, and, and until we got a little bit bigger and then it was like, okay, we had, we started building like relationships with like priority partners, but, it's, but it sounds like maybe that uh, for you, Salesforce was like already a priority partner or like, you, you know, that you were given like, enough room to say hey like salesforce is going to be a high priority like could you tell us a little bit about how that came about and also you know like was that your only partner or did you still have like a portfolio of other partners while you were there as well so yeah no it's definitely we had you know we had a full isv team you know uh partnerships you know uh we we integrated with lots of different different um uh martech companies from a platform perspective, Salesforce was it for us, right? We mm. we had a we had a Microsoft relationship, and that was and Microsoft was actually a, a, one of our largest customers, so there was that. But the the other piece about uh, about that you have to kind of remember. I mean, this is you know this is kind of I'm dating myself a little bit, but software as a service wasn't really a thing. I mean, it was a thing because Salesforce was doing it, right? But it wasn't like everybody had sorted out. So so Salesforce, when we were trying to figure out revenue recognition or how do you provision uh, products and how do you, uh, you know, how do you make sure that you, uh, you know, you have the right compliance and security measures? What's your data center? Like those kind of really kind of in the guts kind of how do you deploy product in a, in a, in a software that hadn't been sorted out by very many people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Salesforce was on the leading edge of that. And so when we had questions, we would call them up and say, hey, like our finance team is trying to figure out how do we do bookings and how do we do renewals? How do you guys do it? And and so there was a like there was like sort of a and we were kind of the country cousin to the big city. Right. And, and you know, the smaller. But those were really productive conversations. And it really, did, it, you know, it expanded almost every aspect of the business, right? So when we talked about, okay, do you, do you go out and on distribution? Do you sign up resellers or do you do referrals or affiliates, right? How do you handle ISVs and what does that look like? What's, you know, marketplace, you know, the app exchange, it, it was already full and flint. And that was at that time was like a moonshot for us. I mean, that like having mm. a commerce, you know, having not only an app catalog, but also a ca- commerce capable I mean, that was like to us, uh, you know, that was either Star Wars or Star Trek. I'm not quite sure which one, but it was out there. Right. It was yeah. like way beyond our capabilities. Right. And so um, so I think that that was, you know, that recognizing where we were at the time, I think just, again, getting getting viral and having those types of conversations, which are not necessarily sales conversations, but they certainly help uh, the sales side. The other part about it is, is like. You know, Scott Dorsey, who's the CEO of, uh, of of Exact Target at the time, believed it in his DNA, right? That he was committed to the partner motion. In some ways, didn't always know how that was going to manifest because mm-hmm. at the time we hadn't really we hadn't really narrowed down on on um, partner source um, opportunities. So I mean, it, 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 keep in mind, you know, back in the day, which isn't that long ago. Uh, Partner source was not like the KPI that everybody today. Now we you look at partnership leaders and you put partner source up there. Everybody's got an opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, absolutely. Number one KPI, number two KPI outside of bookings, right? For sure, right? How do you do it? How do you measure it? What are the attributes yeah. of the partner? All that whole conversation, like what didn't, I mean, we were nowhere near that level of sophistication and that thing, but we got there by figuring out that if you drive partner source revenue, then it gets you all the it gets you the wind at your sales to push through a lot of initiatives, right? If you can solve for that, 
then you can get a lot of things going. So you can get more marketing development fund, you can get more sales support, you can get more access to selling teams, you know, all of that, all things are possible. Um, uh, if you can hit that, everybody, everybody loves the new logo wins, no question, right? That's an easy one. But like to get to the new logo wins, you've got to do the hard work to get you in those deals. You got to find the deals, you got to sell the deals and you got to you know deliver on those deals. And that requires another metric, which is, you know, the partner source lead. So that, I, I think that was a we, were, we we cut our teeth on that. We took a lot of we took a lot of arrows on, on, on that. But but ultimately, I think that was what what drove us forward. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I would imagine that it takes some time to get to that level of maturity with a company like Salesforce. I mean, Salesforce would have been smaller then, obviously. Um, but uh, even still, to be able to be the like, you know, the number one partner and to be able to go viral uh, internally, it, I would imagine that that takes time. And if you're not measuring on partner sourced and, you know, the, and 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 it, the KPIs are a little bit less clear, like how do you, how do you get people to have patience uh, around? Because eventually the, the thing worked really well, but like people would have had to have patiently supported you until it did, right? I mean, it, no one wants to hear this, um, but the reality is it takes three years, right? Mm -hmm. It takes three years. I don't like it. You don't like it. You know, leadership doesn't like it. You know, the board doesn't like it, but the reality is it takes three years. And it, it, because it's just hard, they're, you know, partners are not on our payroll. I, the, you know, I can tell them what to do, but they don't have to listen to me because I'm not, you yeah. know, it, it, and so it takes time. You can circumvent that a little bit by having a network of people that you know and you trust. So I can, you know, I've been able to go out and, you know, talk to people that I've worked with previously and go, hey, we did this thing at this last gig. We got a good thing going on at Sugar. You might want to jump on this and bad And so you kind of circumvent a little bit of that, but there's still a ramp and an onboard and, and they were doing whatever they were doing before I started that conversation. And now I'm asking them to turn, you know, most of those companies are going to be smaller than we are. And so they're going to be able to turn faster than we will. But the reality is it just takes, there's a certain amount of physics. There's gravity involved in, you know, signing contracts, under, you know, getting trained and enabled, getting engaged with sales, creating sales opportunities, getting in the sales opportunities, closing those sales opportunities, and then actually delivering them. Like you got to make sure that that window is short as possible, but mm -hmm. hard business, man. That's, let's yeah. uh, that's, that's the gig though. That's the gig. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the gig. I mean, at that time, it sounds like Microsoft had a competitive product at that time still. And also you had a bunch of experience working with Microsoft and also Microsoft was your biggest customer. And so like, it would have been easy to go and work with Microsoft and just say, Hey, I think that this is going to be our number one partner. Like, what was it about Salesforce that made you say, okay, like we're, we're going to really do this for Salesforce that like, that's going to be our priority. I mean, in hindsight, we sounds really smart, but the reality is we started with sales uh, with Microsoft. We started mm -hmm. with the Dynamics ch channel. We went out, we brought in sales reps f exclusively focused on signing up Dynamics resellers. We went out and did all the road shows and signed everybody up. And we got, a, you know, dozens and dozens of Dynamics partners that were selling, you know, ERP and CRM. It was an abject failure, like an absolute mm -hmm. catastrophic failure, you know, and, you know, it, it just didn't it fail. And part of that was on, probably on us and probably that was on them. I think we we probably went um, we were, you know, too wide and not deep enough um, in terms of what we were able to execute on as a small company. Um, but, yeah, that didn't we didn't really get the lift that we were thinking. Um, the you know, with, with, with Salesforce, they were so you know, they're so um, dialed in on the transactional piece that once you find interest, deals happen right there's enough deal velocity they had, had critical mass and all we had to do is just make sure that we were involved and influenced enough deals and for us you know whatever small percentage of mind share that we had with them was actually significant enough as an isv to, to kind of keep us you know to, to keep everybody fed you know the one thing that i you know that i, I think is important to mention and it, it's kind of a broader topic but you know I think one of the challenges that we run in uh, run into as alliance professionals is that you know we're kind of unique in the sense that every other functional role within an organization be it finance or legal or uh, you know sales or even marketing you know there is a definite def a defined um, uh, sort of um, uh, 
it's a it's a it's a position, right? This is a there's a mastery to it. There's there's it's a defined role, um, clearly defined swim lanes, responsibilities, skill sets to deliver on that. You know, I think there's a perception, um, and obviously all of us are, are are pushing against this perception. But I think that there's there's a perception that anybody can do this job, right? Uh-huh. You can take somebody that is a, and I have this conversation so many times in my career. That's like, well, this guy was washed out as an AE. But he can't sell anything, so we should put him on the partner team. You know, oh, this person was in facilities; they can't really do facilities. But we should put him on the partner team, right? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely crazy because the reality is to be good at this role, you have to know so much about not only your business but the partner's business. I need to know how products are built. I need to know how they're delivered. I know how they're priced, how they're how they're supported, how we sunset them financing, you know, finance, like legal, like I need to know the entire li- the, the life cycle of product delivery. And I need to know that for the partner too. How do they sell? How do they position themselves? All of those things. And that's a pretty broad skill set. And I don't think that a lot of people really recognize that there is a, there is a discipline to this job and there is mastery to this job. And frankly, there's a lot of things that, that, that we do that are very reproducible. You know, we can you know, you throw up any topic on on partnership leaders, affiliate programs, right? Everybody's got an opinion on it. This is how I did it, right? So there's definitely things that we do that are consistent, you know, over and over. But I, I, I think that, you know, part of the the, the the beauty of what partnership leaders does, and I, I, I'm not, I realize I'm shelling for partner leadership, but I do think they're doing a great job, is they're creating that, they're creating that community of practice that this mm-hmm. is a, this is a discipline and it does there are there is apprenticeships there is a mastery um uh to it it's just the industry is so nascent right it's we're we're, we're maybe 20 years into this and SaaS has really the la- been the last 10 or 15 of that right yeah i totally agree and i mean it's like uh really the only go to market function that you have to justify the existence of right you know, it's like uh, sales marketing even customer success even customer success came around after like partnerships and alliances but you know it, it's really rare that any a ceo would say do we need a su- customer success person you know it's like of course you do right. uh, but with partnerships and alliances uh that's definitely been more of a back and forth i would say you know in in the time from when i was uh, optimizely and we were doing partnerships there and this was like right when adobe was launching their partner program like the solution partner program and it was like it felt like early days and they were really coming out with like this modern agency partner program right uh to when i was working at ggv capital and i was working working in venture and like working with a lot of founders it was like I, I didn't know many other people that worked in SaaS that did partnerships. And then I was working at GGV like a decade later and it was like every founder was talking about hiring a partnerships person yeah. as maybe their third or fourth commercial hire. And so it does feel like we're slowly turning a corner. You know, it's like a very uh, broad angle, um, but it does feel like we're kind of rounding on that where it's I think like, it's yeah. happening pretty fast, honestly. Yeah. From my perspective, I mean, you got to remember when I was managing the Microsoft relationship at Pivotal, I didn't know there was anyone else that did this job until I went to a partner advisory council and I met 40 other people just like me, right? And like do the same job, lift working at another ISV, doing other things. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's, you know, it's a Portland Trailblazers fan in Zurich, for God's sake, yeah, yeah. That, you know, let's talk. And that really opened my eyes a lot to, to the, you know, the social aspect of being able to network with people and just best practice. So we would actually meet as a as a advisory council prior to the partner advisory council and pull together an agenda. Right. Which mm-hmm. was, was was brilliant. But uh, I love those sessions. Um, I, but I think that that if you look at it now, fast forwarding now, if you look at just the number, I mean, I haven't looked at the count lately, lately just on partner leadership. You know, there's thousands of people that are on that. So, I mean, yeah. And you start to see partnerships, uh, partner programs becoming earlier and earlier in the stage of the development of a company. So now you have series A, B, C funded companies that are like, oh, we're going to build out a partner program. They might not even have a product. They don't even know how to what their product does or how to sell it or how to, like and they're going to build a partner program. OK, yeah, that's cool. That's that's going to be hard. But, yeah, that, that, it's cool to see that. Um, so I do think it's I think there's been a, a mass acceleration, but I still kind of getting to my point of not a, a total appreciation for the for the for the discipline. I think 
a lot of people love the idea of putting logos up on the slide, uh, you know, put the logo, we all have them, right? Here's the website with all my logos. Isn't that cool? Um, they like that and they like the partner source um, opportunities, the revenue through partner sourced oper opportunities. What I think is is missing is in, in, in many, many cases, they underestimate what's required to, to deliver on that outcome, right? Yeah. Like organizationally. I mean, they can hire you or me and they can put that in and and you can you you can run hard, run fast. But without the organization, without that top down piece and without the organization that will support that go to market function, then you're just not going to be optimized. Right. It's just not going to go as far as fast as you want it to. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I loved what you were talking about with the kind of top down support from the CEO. And uh, that's something at partnership leaders that we've really tried to make an effort to do is like as much thought leadership as that we can as we can get out into the market that we think like founders are potentially going to pick up on and read and like maybe their VCs are going to share it with founders and things like that. And like try to advocate to the CEO uh, so that it trickles down to the partnerships people in the community. Uh, we've been trying to do that a lot. I, I, I would love to talk a little bit about the, so, you, so you're at exact target, the acquisitions happening. Like what was that experience like? Uh, you know, I've never been in an acquisition, an acquisition of kind of two mega companies like that. I mean, you know, I remember that being announced and happening and it being a really big deal in the industry. Like what was that like uh, from yeah. the inside? I mean, again, you know, we knew at that time that it was a pretty spe special place, right? We knew mm -hmm. that this was, this was, and you know, I would, I had been in the, in, in the industry long enough to know that this doesn't happen every day. And so we made a very conscious effort to be present, right. To understand, look around, right. The journey is, is, you know, uh, is, uh, is a big part of that. So I think there was a general awareness of, just that we were in the eye of the hurricane and this was this was you know not going to last forever and so enjoy it now so we had you know the the first and foremost it was a fantastic place to work just in terms of the energy mm -hmm. the vibrance tons of super smart people um and and just doing a lot of really crazy things really hard work i mean you always work hard but it, somehow when you have that mission you know you put in that work and you're willing to do it again tomorrow and and so that was pretty cool we also went through a couple things first we ipo'd uh largest SaaS ipo at the time um you know that's been now you know eclipsed a dozen times over, but at the time it was the largest SaaS uh, IPO. And then uh, I think it was maybe 90 days later that Salesforce acquired us. And so that was the largest acquisition that Salesforce had done. And they then went off and they, did, they didn't They did do a lot of technology acquisitions up until that point. And since then they've been on a, a fairly consistent role. So we felt pretty special, right? I mean, it was, a, you know, we were kind of the unicorn and, and I will say, you know, I've gone through integrations both as the acquiring company and as the company being acquired and they all they, they're always terrible right i mm -hmm. mean you lose people things change i mean people are generally change averse anyway things always are going to change and the reason you joined the company you know um that you joined you joined for different reasons now it becomes a different company so are those reasons still valid or not and is the new company better than the other one so there, you, you got to go through those kind of um, yeah. maturations but i will say you know to, to salesforce's credit that integration was not seamless, but it was it was super um, it, it was super easy, right? I mean, we were already engaged at the field, from my standpoint, right? I my my focus was aligning the partner community with the direct sellers and figuring out okay, what partners to be involved in what deals at what time. My job got easier to do that. It got bigger in terms of the number of people that I was interfacing with, but it just we had the sales motion we had the playbook and we knew what to do and we had many of the relationships already in place. So we were able to hit the ground running on that. Um, and then the numbers just got super, like, like they just keep going up. Right. And, and, uh, and so that was, uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, it, I say overall, it was fantastic. It was, you, you know, it was great to see, you know, the company that really defined what SAS is, um, you know, that, that it was pretty cool to see, to be part of that, uh, you know, uh, you know, that, it was a, a fleeting port amount for me. It was a four-year stint, but but it was great to be part of that, um, part of that process. Because let's all face it, I have a job because of Mark Benioff figured out how to sell software as a service, right? So, you know, uh, thanks, Mark. 
Uh, yeah, a lot of us, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few of us in that bucket. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's all, that's amazing. And and so, come on, tell us about this giant quota then. Uh, you, you said you had a big quota there. What what kind of quota were you carrying at Salesforce? Uh, I mean, I think at this point, there's a, the statute of limitations up, but my last quota was $125 million. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's and, really and serious. I, and it happened every, every year you get your quota and you're just like, there's no way I could hit that. That is, that's 40% more than I did last year. What? There's no way we can do it. Lo and behold, fourth quarter rolls around, you make your number. I, it was just like, and I had, I, I, that happened every year that I was there. I mean, it was just like, you, you put up these numbers and you're like, oh my God, I've never seen that many numbers with my name attached to it ever, you know? So uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, but there was such a, you know, there, the, there was so much momentum behind, you know, it, it, Tyler Prince was really the first one for me that I heard really talk about the ecosystem of opportunity, right? And he would talk about, you know, the aggregate opportunity for Salesforce and then talk about, yeah, so, and, and it was like a 10x difference, right? So Salesforce is going to sell whatever crazy number, you know, insert crazy billions of dollars here, but the partner ecosystem is going to generate 10x that in terms of add-on services, third-party products, you know, and and um, uh, managed service offerings, right? And I think, you know, that sort of messaging was um, that was that was kind of a, a you know sort of a transformative stage for me because then you started to talk then partners started to look at it and go okay this now I understand this makes sense right this this is uh, this is a business that I can invest in because I want a piece of that whatever that 10x pie is yeah that's amazing and uh, and did you say it was at Salesforce where you were working with the BPOs and the managed service companies or... yeah I mean that was really kind of the the start of it there was a little bit of, back then it was referred to a little bit like OEM but yeah. uh, or white labeling but fundamentally it was a, you know a BPO kind of offering um you know uh if that job has gotten a lot easier now I think just with the standardization of technology mm -hmm. a little um you know multi-tenant software helps and and just the way that product is released and, and back in the day when you have a single instance, single, single partner, th those, those, those products tend to get, you know, kind of um, age out, right? Because they get connect disconnected from your primary roadmap and then they get orphaned, right? So at some point the product doesn't become as more uh, as viable in the market, but now with current, you know, um, uh, architecture, the way um, SaaS solutions are currently architected, you can, sort of uh, you can reskin that UI and still maintain, you know, the, the base platform uh, and continue to enhance and, and develop the platform. And that and that BPO doesn't get orphaned. Right. They don't get sent out on some, you know, they don't get uh, put on an island. Yeah. OK, that's awesome. And, and so you said uh, that and I loved it uh, in your in introduction where you said that, like, you were also, you know, learning still now at sugar crm and you know like uh having to you know re rethink relearn like adjust your approach i think that that is just like such an amazing level of humility given given you know this amazing because we haven't even gone through your full experience right we've kind of we're, we're skipping uh some pretty serious roles about yeah. sugar crm yeah yeah exactly but like <laughs> uh, so, want to hear about my resume but no, no. yeah yeah no but I, but like uh so, <laughs> I, I mean firstly just uh hats off to you because i think it would be way easier to just come in and be like okay i know the stuff I've, I've been doing this and i've done it successfully at some great companies but like tell me a couple of the things were that you've you've had to revisit or that maybe weren't as uh weren't the way that you'd seen them in the past or like that would be awesome to hear yeah i, I mean I, I think part of it being a part of being humil uh, a humble is being humiliated right and knowing like i'm making <laughs> you know, so I, I, trust me i've gone in and i've done the same playbook sent the same presentation that i did six months earlier at another company and then gotten my teeth kicked in because it's completely off topic or you know we tried that it didn't work or whatever and so part of that is just the fact that you gotta be you can't get set into a certain, the job is so dynamic, the market is so dynamic, customers are so dynamic, the way customers buy is so dynamic that you have to constantly challenge yourself to say, is this the right way to do it? And, and mm -hmm. Sugar is not Salesforce, right? It's completely, yeah, we're in the same space, but that's, you know, it's like me and Lance Armstrong. We both know how to ride bikes, okay, but we're very different, right? Um, 
I'm not nearly as good a bicyclist as Lance, just to point out the obvious. Uh, the, so the thing is, you got to you got to constantly challenge yourself to make sure that you're making the right decisions and not taking the easy way out, which is rinse and replace replace your playbook from the previous gig and then trying it here. And so that's the that's the first thing. The other thing I'd say is sort of more, you know, sort of, you know, uh, I think reselling is the one area where I, you know, first and foremost, I had, there was 450 resellers that we had signed up at exact target and, and we ended up going back and, and really calling that significantly. Um, mostly because there was a, a huge portion of those um, resellers just failed to launch, right? They just, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, part of that was on us, part of that was on them, market, product, whatever. There was some combinant confluence of events there that, that just didn't, they did fail to meet the expectations. So we ended up calling that way back. And then post acquisition, we ended up cutting it back even further and kind of, mm-hmm. kind of carving out a little bit of a DMZ um, for that um, because Salesforce didn't have a reseller program. And so, um, so, uh, you know, where I'm at today, because when I came into Sugar, there was 135 partners, uh, our uh, resellers globally, five distributors. And, you know, I still believe in the distribution model, you know, especially within emerging markets, especially when there's a language um, issue, taxation, in uh, currency, you know, there's a there's a number of uh, factors in emerging markets where that makes sense. I think for areas where you're, you know, where you do have a direct selling team, I, I think reselling is, needs a reboot. Like I think that concept in software as a service needs to change because what customers, at least from my perspective, are seeing as your product gets more mature and and gets more sophisticated, the you're not going to go to, you know, Best Buy and buy, you know, Sugar CRM, right? You're not going to go to Ingram Micro or what have you to, to buy that. There's a whole consultative process that needs to take place that I don't think is really well served in the in, in a pure bar model. I think bar is a very dated, like OEM is a very dated term and, mm-hmm. and is, is ripe for a, for a refresh. I still think from from a channel perspective, working with third parties, you know, co-selling with three parties, but I just don't believe that, you know, that the VAR model is, is delivering significant value. And I don't think, I think the potential is it, it doesn't deliver um, a lot of, um, I think it, it could be some, somewhat of a second tier experience um, for customers, I think, which is mm-hmm. the bigger, the bigger part. But I think there's a huge opportunity for consultancies, advisory services, and people, even if, you know, if my son were going to college tomorrow, I would say, you want to be a consultant because you want to be able to walk in and be able to say, this is what your requirements are. Based on your requirements, there's these tools that are available of the tool. This is the one that I think is the most ideal, but you should evaluate these other ones. There's that's where the real power in the equation is. And as software sellers, we could say the exact same thing as that consultant, but we're software so because we're software people. Yeah. We're never going to have the same level of credibility. So the influencers in that equation are the people that are providing the services and that have been that trusted advisor to the customer. Um, and so that you know that introduces whether that's an agency or whether that's a consultancy, whether that's a you know a, a outsourced IT, whatever. Um, I think there's a very very important role for them. I just don't know if, if it, the transaction is a bar. Like, I don't think it's a resell. Uh, I, I I would I think we're ready for a, a new modality there. Yeah, there's a, I I agree with you that a lot of those terms are outdated, and it, I I find myself even in my current role trying to apply the old terms to like what we're doing today. And you know you, you can you kind of just about squeezing in what you're doing uh, into something that fits historically, but really like what people meant when they said OEM is not what anything like what we're doing today right, right? Um, yeah. but you just it's it's just like kind of evolved in that direction you need a new metaphor right like the the auto manufacturing metaphor is is dated it's like you know you got yeah. you got gm and you got ac delco right like like okay that we need a new whatever i don't know what that is maybe it's cooking yeah or like that or food distribution i'm not quite sure but yeah something there. yeah i don't know maybe we can come up with something <laughs> well i mean as we kind of come up on time i'd love to just uh ask you our regular question which is what's something that you learned recently that you'd be excited to share with everyone so uh literally just just this weekend came across uh uh, there's a trending YouTube video on the Foo Fighters and, and the son uh, of Tyler Hawkins performing. 
uh, first and foremost, has nothing to do with, you know, partnering or alliances. What it talks to is that kid is playing like his life dependent on it, right? The passion that he has in that is, I, I mean, there's no deniable. And he's going through, you can see as he goes through that whole evolution of he's, you know, he's tentative at first and he's like overwhelmed by the moment and, and he gets into it and then he gets into it and he crushes it. And he, you could like, it's, I mean, like, honestly, the number of people that I've talked to just said I'm bawling by the end of this is, uh, and the, the takeaway for me is that it, when it matters, um, you know, it, it, that's when it's fun, right? That when, when, I mean, there's so much history and there's so much going on in that current situation, you know, with his father and whatnot, there was just, but it matters to that kid. He has no, he is singularly focused on execution at that point. And the results of that were just an epic, you know, performance. And if you want epic performances, you got to give a shit, right? That's the yeah. thing, right? And, and uh, you know, pardon my language, we can edit that out post. But the, uh, the, <laughs> but the, the reality is, is that when it matters, it, 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 it means the difference. And so, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, having that Doug Bergen vision and having, you know, the, the Scott Dorsey the commitment to partnership. And the reason that made business sense is it because is it, mat it mattered to everybody that was involved in that interaction. And guess what? When you do that, people want to be part of that. People want that. Right. I'm sharing that with everybody. And like we're talking about it. Right. Um, it makes the job a lot easier when you have that that sort of mission level you know, commitment. So I, I think I had to, I think I probably knew that at one point, but it just seemed to remind me of the, the importance of it uh, 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 just this, this last weekend. Yeah, I know. I love that. And I, I, I watched the video as well and it was uh, exhilarating, okay, you know, just amazing. It reminded me, you know, I, uh, if you're a, a rock fan, you know, with uh, John and Jason Bonham, and yeah. how they had Jason Bonham start playing for the Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just like absolute magic to see. It's a, yeah. a really cool, really inspiring stuff. Well, Tom, I, I, I think we could have dug in a lot more. Uh, but also, you know, like I, I say this very often on these conversations that I could just like keep talking about this for hours. I love your reference of the, you know, like finding a Trailblazers fan, you know, like that has been what the partnership leaders community has been. And also like what these conversations have been for me, where it's like, oh my gosh, like th this is so fascinating, you know? Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of share your experience and insights with me and also the other folks that are going to listen to this. So thank you so much. No, it's been a ton of fun. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in what, what, you know, what we're doing here. I think it's the greatest job in the world. Um, and I think collectively, if we can, if we can kind of create a, a, a community of practice, come together as a community of practice, then I think we got, we all have very, very bright futures. So uh, appreciate the opportunity. So thanks guys. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you.